joining us. I'm very uh, happy to have Dr. Khan Kangar again for Global Marxism Online Talks, which is organized by Social Science Korea Research Project, named as Searching for the First Capitalist Alternatives in the Anthropocene Through the Innovation of Marxism. Uh, let me introduce the presenter. The Professor Khan Kangal is the Associate Professor of the Department of Philosophy, Nanjing University in People's Republic of China. He has written a range of articles to tackle with the dialectics, hermeneutics, and metaphysics, and Marx and Gas research. His work on Marx's Bone Notebooks won the David Ryazanov Prize 2019, which he was published and translated in Historical Materialism 2020, last year. Uh, <clears throat> it will be presented on today's talk. Uh, his most interesting to, uh, his publication is Friedrich Engels and the Dialectics of Nature, uh, published by Palgrave last year, 2020. I am really honored to be with him for today's talks. Today's the title of the talk is Young Marxist Ideology of Aesthetics uh, Born Not. I suppose Professor Kang Kangal will deal with the interesting intellectual scene of young Marx's critical years. Around that time, uh, Marx struggled to come up with uh, his own materialist thought through criticism of religion, uh, with which most of young Hegelians preoccupied. We are likely to be very familiar with the affinity and the departure with the young Hegelians that Marx made in his early days, and among others, the critique of religion was crucial to build the materialist science of historical social relations. In terms of it, the phase of investigation and the polemics with and against the young Hegelian philosophers will inform uh, Marx's embryo of historical materialist thoughts. In particular, the divergence of, uh, with Bruno Bauer, who was the prominent figure to construct the religious philosophy to criticize the religion appropriating Hegel's self-consciousness doctrine. I am sure that Professor Khan Kangal will introduce us the critical reconstruction of collaboration between Marx and Bauer. Khan Kangal, as a presenter, will have around 40 minutes for talk, and then we will have a question and answer. Uh, when you have any questions or comments about Professor Kangal's presentation, do not hesitate to raise your hands or post the message on the chat room. Please welcome Professor Khan Kangal. Okay, uh, thank you very much for having me again in this round. And in total, I think this has been the third time I am participating in this organization, twice virtually, once physically. Um, so today's topic is the so-called Marx Bond Notebooks. I think I have to say a couple of things why I am occupied with, with this topic, because it is not really self-explaining why someone would do research on a thing like this that is hardly known. Um, so about that, and I will mention a couple, couple of difficulties of doing research on, on notebooks, and then I'm going to read a few passages that I have written very recently. It's not the, um, it's not from the uh, article I've recently published, but something uh, more recent. So, uh, to be honest, how I came to this topic is through really a matter of chance. I was just asked to prepare a short report on Marx Bond Notebooks, uh, written probably in 1841-42. And this is how it all started in 2018, I believe. And the topic became bigger and bigger and it, it turned into a massive research project because this is something that is under-researched. It is hardly known, an episode that is extremely obscure in Marx's intellectual journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, this also is accompanied by a couple of difficulties, uh, usually in Marx research uh, or in, in Marx scholarship. The kind of object of research is something that is written and that is there so that people take up this text and they discuss about this. Mm -hmm. Now in bond notebooks and uh, what these notebooks were written for um, uh, are actually a little um, puzzling to say the least. And the reason is this, these bond notebooks have been written for a treatise on Christian art that Marx attempted to write in the beginning of 1842. 
So the interesting thing about the, this treatise on Christian art is that it is lost. So the discussion is actually something like an archaeological ex excavation that we try to dig up something that has been lost. And this is the uh, paradoxical thing about doing um, a research on Bonotus because Bonotus are the residue of uh, the, this uh, Christian art. Um, so my significant date, uh, there was a very specific date that I'm going to talk about, and this is 20th March, 1842. So this is like a story that clusters around this, this, um, this particular date, and I very much focus on what happened on that day. Uh, there is something like an uh, important turn in Mark's understanding of Christian art and his occupation with Christian art, and there is a certain shift that took place on that particular time. And I will say a couple of things about that. And a last thing to keep in mind, now, whenever there is a talk about young Marx, the usual points of reference are either dissertation that was written and uh, that was finished in 1841. And um, after that, there is the newspaper articles that Marx had written in 1842-43. So there's also some debate about that. And then immediately after that, there is the uh, critique of Hegel, Hegel's philosophy of Freud in 1843. And then after that, there is the Paris manuscript in 1844. So these are the usual points of reference that you would find in Marx research. And um, in most of the Marx biographies, there is this gap that is usually overlooked. There is always this kind of leap from Marx's dissertation to uh, the uh, newspaper articles in 1842, 43, and so on and forth. So I am uh, rather interested in this gap that uh, I am interested in this event that took place between dissertation and the uh, newspaper articles. And uh, it, is, it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that um, this, this treatise, as well as Marx's notebooks, is probably the most obscure episode in Marx's life. So now I will proceed uh, reading from this, uh, this short piece I have, I have written, and I will also have a look at my time. Uh, let's see how far I go. There are episodes in Marx's life that go unnoticed or that are considered in insignificant in Marx's scholarship, that Marx wrote the treatise on Christian art in 1841, 42, and a group of excerpts that is the non bond notebooks on the history of religious art resulting from it is a case in point. The treatise and the accompanying notebooks are either completely absent from Marx's biographies or, and studies on young Marx, or they are mentioned only in passing, or if the notebooks are considered at all, usually one portion is singled out while the rest is effectively ignored. A treatise on Christian art, as Marx once called his piece, was originally planned to be a chapter contribution to Bruno Bauer's Hegel's Doctrine of Religion and Art Judged from the Standpoint of Faith, published in May 1842. Hegel's Doctrine was written as a follow-up volume of another book by Bauer, that is, The Trumpet of the Last Judgment of, on Hegel, the Atheist and the Antichrist, an ultimatum that went to print in November 1841. Yet Hegel's doctrine appeared without the section that was initially prepared by Marx. Using the excuse that the trumpet was censored in the beginning of 1842, Marx decided on 5th March 1842 to publish his treatise as a separate article in Arnold Ruger's journal, Anecdota. Despite renewed promises, to Ruger on 20th March and 27th April 1842 to modify and develop the piece, Marx failed to finalize and submit it. Marx's treatise is now lost, but its textual residue, that is the notebooks as it were, has survived. Drawing on Marx's bond notebooks, along with Bauer's two volumes, Marx's letters to Ruger and Bauer, some of Marx's 1842 articles in Rheinische Zeitung, the Rhenish newspaper, as well as Marx's earlier aesthetic passions, there have been some, if rare, attempts to reconstruct this curious episode in Marx's life and to figure out, first, 
what Marx may have ultimately aimed at in the treaties. Second, what the main argument of the treaties may have been. And third, why he did not come to finalize and publish it. To the three questions about, the following answers have been suggested in the literature. The answer to the first question, the general aim of the treaties was probably to intervene in the cultural religious battle over art. And to that end, to undertake a historical critical analysis of the ideological foundations of the Christian German orientation that was woven together with the name of Friedrich Wilhelm IV. This is the Prussian king since 1840. In this regard, Marx may have intended to provide a fundamental criticism of religion and religious art. He may have particularly targeted the state approved romantic Christian art and its admiration for the pious Middle Ages, offering a defense of Greek art as the antidote that amounted at the same time to an attempt to restore to the revolutionary democratic ideals of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. The second answer, the, the answer to the second question is this, responding to the quarrel of the ancients and the moderns, Marx may have assumed a classicist position against Christian romantic proponents of art, and he may have launched an ad hominem attack against the proclaimed cultural art artistic purity of the Romantics. He may have specifically argued that the Christian Germanic art support, supported by Friedrich Wilhelm IV and his Romantic circle is full of unchristian, pagan, ancient elements. Exposing the similarities between Greek and Christian art would have revealed that Christian culture had been based on a primitive fetishistic treatment of objects and had been a development away from the standard of civilization of the Hellenic world rather than a progression beyond it. This position may have also necessitated Marx to critically take up and according to revise the Hegelian configuration of religion, art and religious art. So the answer to the third question has been proposed as follows. Marx failed to finalize the treaties either because either because he was increasingly involved in practical political struggles during his journalistic activities in Rheinische Zeitung and distances himself from abstract philosophical theoretical concerns. And relatedly, he may have come to doubt the correctness of his earlier plans for a critical take on religious arts or because the prospect of censorship was probably the main reason why Marx finally decided not to publish his treaties. So these are the opinions we have in the literature. It is very rare to find research on this, but this is pretty much what I was able to gather. So in other words, Marx's treatise is suspected to be a field Hellenic assault on the romantic Christian art, whose proponents were openly admired by and received the support of the Prussian state. Accordingly, he possibly aimed to focus on historically alien components of the self-proclaimed authenticity of the German Christian art. The cultural contaminators that Marx is felt to have singled out are Greek paganism and fetishistic art associated with it. That Marx eventually did not publish his long promised treaties is either because he may have doubted his earlier eclecticism, a conviction that was perhaps nourished by his initially unwitting occupation with material struggles within the realm of daily politics, or because he was probably simply scared off by the Prussian censorship policy. So now I come to what I believe the, ca the case of Marx may have been, my response. I believe that this image of Marx is to some degree a monolithic, anachronistic and partial construction of his aesthetic political under undertaking between autumn 1841, summer 1842. It is monolithic as it collapses the distinction between Bauer's undertaking, Marx's planned contribution to it, and Marx's changing concerns within the framework of religious art. It is anachronistic insofar as it projects Marx's later interest in fetishism and idolatry, idolatry back into his earlier investigation on German Christian art. Finally, 
that is partial for Marx's occupation with Greek and Egyptian arts is hardly investigated. In this regard, we need a more nuanced view on the political and aesthetic concerns that have driven Marx to devote himself to such a task and a more comprehensive account that considers the distinction between Bauer's volumes, Marx's planned treaties, and Marx's bond notebooks. What seems to be missing from the past accounts of young Marx's politics of aesthetics is as follows. First, that Bauer and Marx plan to collaborate on Hegel's doctrine does not mean that what Bauer expected from Marx is necessarily identical with what Marx was prepared to offer. There are sections in Hegel's doctrine that were originally reserved for Marx's contribution, yet eventually written by Bauer himself. These sections document Bauer's own projections, hence they embody the kind of contribution that he would have had asked Marx to write. This is to be dis differentiated from Marx's treatise on Christian art. Second, it does not suffice to distinguish Bau Bauer's expectations from Marx's potential response. One also needs to acknowledge the mini evolution that Marx's treatise went through in the first half of 1842. On 5th March, Marx promised to send to Ruger a lightly modified version of his treatise on Christian art. On 20th March, he decided to change the title from On Christian Art to On Religion and Art with special reference to Christian art. For, quote, I am examining this subject from a new point of view, end of quote. On 27th April, he found out that the article on religious art has now grown into almost book dimensions, and quote, I have been drawn into all kinds of investigations, which will still take a rather long time. End of quote. On 9th July, Marx will be mentioning the treatise for the last time. Quote, I was not able to elaborate in particular the article on art and religion as thoroughly as the subject requires. End of quote. Particularly, the letter from 20th March provides insights into a substantial turn in Marx's work on the treatise that point to a shift away from Christian art to a more comprehensive, more encompassing take on religion and art. Third, potentially the most fruitful resource for understanding the concerns and the general scope of Marx's treaties remains Marx's bond notebooks. Yet the notebooks also prove to be a notoriously difficult material to work with, as they contain Marx's excerpts from seven different authors on the history of religious art in various geographies, with almost no commentary made by Marx himself. This is important for my purpose is to establish the approximate sequence of notebooks as they came into being and delve into the content of the excerpted passages. For these notebooks not only highlight Marx's shifting concerns and changing scope, but also inform us about the kind of cultural aesthetic polarities against which Marx positioned himself. Provided Mar Christian art represents Marx's point of departure in the treaties, it seems to explore it in connection with its pagan opposite. Marx's readings on Greek painting and sculpture prompts him to pay some attention to the Egyptian influence on Greek art. And late March 1842, Marx seems to turn away from his pursuit of Christian, Greek, and Egyptian arts to fetishism and idolatry. Accordingly, the binary opposites that define Marx's undertaking do not seem to be constrained to classicism versus romanticism. Clearly, Marx also developed a, developed a critical sensibility to the image of Greece as imposed by classicists and romantics, as well as to the European colonial images of distinct cultures such as African and American Indian societies. So the questions are these, what sort of contribution might Marx have hold appropriate for Bauer's project? Why did he distance himself from his initial undertaking on Christian art? What drove him to think Greek and Egyptian precursors of Christian art be relevant and how to explain Marx's turn to fetishism and idolatry? These questions call for careful reconstruction of Marx's relation to Bauer's project, as well as for a close reading of the notebooks. So in this presentation, I'm not going to answer all these questions. It is rather a um, tall order for the given the uh, formal limits of uh, this presentation, 
but I'm going to you know, try to draw a more or less vivid image of this background of, of this undertaking relationship between Bauer and Marx and so on. So first of all, a couple of uh, things on Bauer's two volumes for which Marx intended to write his contribution and then change his mind. Bauer's volumes are a spectacular example of philosophy fiction. He assumes there the role of a pietist conservative opponent of the Hegelian philosophy, attacking the straw man that he erects. Yet Bauer's real concern is to positively extrapolate Hegel's thought to propagate his own Republican ideal of social freedom and an atheist philosophy of self-consciousness. To, to this end, Bauer initiates to impress his readers, incite fear, create outrage, anticipate terror, and provoke conflict. Concealing Bauer's authentic views, the pseudo-author of the Trumpet and Hegel's doctrine depict, depicts Hegel as, the, uh, as a sublimely demonic force. Hegel's presumed invisible hand behind the world of nightmares is presented in four crucial images of hostility, of which the last constitutes Marx's point of departure. First, the atheist enemy of Jewish Christian religions. Second, the Jacobin revolutionary enemy of the Pr Prussian monarchy. Third, the French enemy of the German nation. And fourth, the pagan Hellenic enemy of the J Christian German art. Bauer's pseudo-author invites his readers to join him in a safe harbor from which Hegel's hidden terrorism will be exposed and his plans to destroy the kingdom of God will be unmasked. Hegel is transformed into an object of fear in order to convert that fear into a violent resistance against him. Bauer's pietist just needs to make sure that Hegel poses a sufficiently evil threat to deserve a divine revenge. This revenge is staged in the act anarchy of the Last Judgment that also figures as the title of Bauer's first volume. Angels will certainly blow the last trumpet for all, but Bauer's pietist promises that Hegel will receive a special treatment. When the trumpets are blown for Hegel on his judgment day, his place will be secured in hell along with other deliberate sinners, pagans, and heretics. In this plot, Hegel appears not only religiously poisonous, but also politically toxic. While German romantics were ashamed of their early affinity to the French Revolution, Hegel, along with Goethe, was remembered for his admiration for Napoleon's redesign of Europe, despite the French invasion of German territories and the total defeat of Prussian and Austrian armies. For Bauer's pietist, Hegel not only failed to condemn the French colonization of the German states, but he even successfully hid his Jacobin thirst for blood. Curiously, this enemy within also enthusiastically engaged with the Greek ideal of political freedom and artistic beauty, a trained newly emerging spirit of a religious patriotic German Christian art. To paraphrase Schiller, Bauer's undertaking can be said to boil down to an aesthetic miseducation that intends to inject an imaginary terror into the political unconscious of the German public. The recollection of traumatic memories of the French Catholic occupation of the Protestant Prussia is combined with Hegel, Hegel's atheist philosophical monster lurking around and waiting for the most vulnerable moment to finally smash the German religious national dignity into pieces. Bauer seems convinced that the register of his aesthetic ideology of terror would be complete if his pseudo pietist account could be expanded to the artistic domain, an arena that no German intellectual could afford to ignore. This is where Marx comes in. Marx was to provide support for Bauer's pseudo pietist narrative on one side and for Bauer's authentic argument on religion and art on the other. Regarding Bauer's pietist narrative, Marx was supposed to delve into the emotional triggers of the German aesthetic culture to transform Mark Bauer's theater of terror into a stage where Bauer could finally launch an attack 
against the pietist outrage at the dark legacy of Hegel's philosophy, a sentiment that Bauer himself ventured to nourish in the first place. In other words, Marx agreed to help Bauer to cultivate and domesticate Hegel's implied opponents in order to achieve active mastery over them. Bauer's readers had to be terrified first so that they could be seemingly rescued from Hegel's hostage. However, what was actually awaiting them was Bauer's final battle against them. Regarding Bauer's authentic position, that is Bauer's real position, real thought, Marx was supposed to reinforce the argument that religion and religious employment of art are forms of alienation as they conceal the human element that creates artifacts of worship to which human beings are subordinate. Believers are mystified by the auratic effects of sacred objects to the extent that they forget the human origins of religious institutions. Bauer is in favor of an antagonistic struggle of art for its emancipation from the dictates of religion. The very craft of artistic practice testifies to the intrinsic autonomy of aesthetics that experiences a loss when dominated by religious dogmas. The point, however, is to become aware that not only artistic artifacts, but also religious institutions are products of human hand. Following this framework, Marx was asked to turn the subordinate place of art within the Hegelian conception of religion upside down and to depict religion as a form of artistic practice. In approaching Marx's promised contribution to Bauer's project, it is crucial to make a distinction between, this, between the time period within which Bauer's framework remained predominant for Marx treaties and the time period within which Marx no longer felt obliged to effectively respond to Bauer's demands. One can conveniently locate the switch between these two periods in Marx's letter to Ruger on 20 March. 1842. Up until 20th March, Marx persistently defined the objective of his treaties as Christian art. Even when he suggested to Ruge on 5th March to publish it as a separate article, he only spoke of minimal modifications suitable for the new format. Things changed on 20th March when Marx decided to undertake a major revision of the piece. He was now willing to expand the topic from Christian art to religion and art with special reference to Christian art and working on a supplement on the Romantics. This was accompanied by a new narrative that abandoned Marx's rhetoric of terror. Consequently, Marx's trumpet tone was to be replaced by a freer and therefore more thorough exposition. As a result of his continuing research, he also felt it necessary to speak about the general sense of religion. Significantly, the same letter provides some further clues about his new point of view. Animism and fetishism, two issues that are beyond the scope of Bauer's project. Marx brought up there the degradation of, the, of people to the level of animals, the edification of animals, and the irony of a religious zoology instead of a religious anthropology. Marx's next letter to Ruge on 27th April does not offer any insight into the content of the revised treatise, but he reports there that the work has steadily grown into almost book dimensions, for he has been drawn into all kinds of investigations, which will still take a rather long time. Since Marx's treatise is now lost, one could speculate at best as to what particular avenues he may have pursued in the first half of 1841, in the first half of 1842. Having said that, Marx's notebooks provide access not to his argument, but to the scope of his treatise, both before and after 20th March. Remarkably, Christian and Greek arts that occupied him until 20th March are also the subjects of his first two notebooks, Carl Friedrich von Rumor's Italian Investigations, Notebook One, and Johann Jakob Grund's The Painting of the Greeks, Notebooks One and Two. 
Furthermore, when he assumed a new point of view and undertook all kinds of investigations around 20th March, he was primarily concerned with animism, fetishism, and religion and art in general. And these are the topics of the rest of his notebooks. Charles de Bros on the worship of fetish gods, notebook three. Carl August Bertiger's ideas on art mythology, notebook three. Christoph Miner's general critical history of religions, notebook four. Benjamin Constance on the religion, notebooks five and six. And Jean Bar Barberat's treatise on the morals of church fathers, notebook seven. In other words, Marx's excerpts take up questions on Christian art in Rumor and Grund, on ancient Greek art in Rumor and Grund, on Egyptian art in Grund, on fetishism in De Bros, Bertiger Miners, and idolatry in Constant and Barberac. Therefore, it is plausible to assume that Marx consulted Rumor and Grund possibly before 20th March and the process Bertiger, Miners, Constant, and Barberac round and after 20th March. So I'm not going to um, discuss in detail what is written in the notebooks. That is a, a rather, that requires another presentation, I believe. But what I'm going to now uh, say concerns a couple of things that are more familiar uh, to Marx scholarship, and that concerns the usage, employment of the terms fetish in 1842 in Marx's writings. So we know that as early as 1842, the terms fetish and idolatry were already cropping up in Marx's newspaper articles. In his On Freedom of the Press, Marx ironically remarked, quote, of course, the province has the right under prescribed conditions to create these gods for itself, but as soon as they are created, it must, like a fetish worshiper, forget that these gods are its own handiwork. And the same essay, he combined his critique of censorship with the idolatry of the representatives of privileged classes who idolize and canonize themselves. Quote, they draw a horrifying picture of human nature and at the same time demand that we should bow down before the holy image of certain privileged individuals, end of quote. In the leading article in number 179 of the Kölnische Zeitung, Marx takes issue with the editor of the Kölnische Zeitung, Karl Hermes, who demanded Prussian censorship against the young Hegelians and defended Christianity as the basis of the Prussian state. The concept of the fetish becomes a preliminary subject of discussion here as Marx uses the theocratic idea of the state against Hermes line of argument. Hermes, Marx writes, assigns fetishism, the historical function of elevating man above sensual desires. But if man is completely dominated by a religious fetish, fetish Hermes believed, he is degraded to an animal. Hermes indirectly admitted, or continued, that the animal worship is a higher form of religion than fetishism. The animal worship degrades man below the animal and makes the animal man's god. In debates on the law on thefts of wood, Marx criticized the law restricting the parceling of land ownership in the Prussian Rhine province. Dispossessed masses who collected products from the forests were severely punished. In this respect, Marx made an analogy between the gold fetish of Spanish settlers in Cuba and the wood fetish of landowners in the Rhine province. Quote, the savages of Cuba regarded gold as a fetish of the Spaniards. They celebrated a feast in its honor, sang in a circle around it, and then threw it into the sea. If the Cuban savages had been present at the setting of the Rhine province assembly, would they not have regarded wood as the Rhineland, Rhinelanders fetish? But a subsequent setting would have thought them that the 
worship of animals is connected with this fetishism and they would have thrown the hares into the sea in order to save the human beings, end of quote. The application of fetish and idolatry figures to relations at the time was certainly not entirely new. Immanuel Kant, for example, depicted all ecclesiastical image worship and the related relationship of bondage or servitude between God and man as contrary to the basic ideals of enlightenment. He reproached the church for transforming the service of God into mere fetish, which undoes all work towards true religion. Fetish or idolatry, he argued, not only displaces religion, but also morality and human freedom. So it is always a fetish belief by which the crowd rules and by obedience to a church, not religion, is robbed of its moral freedom. The Eurocentric way of thinking that began directly from foreign images of European settlers in Africa and ascribed religious practices of foreign cultures to an archaic mindlessness, Kant thus turned into its opposite by drawing attention to the echoes of the same pattern of thought in the heart of Europe. He was able to connect archaic elements of foreign cultures originally attributed to the distant land with church religious practices, thus showing resonances of archaic cultures and the European context, albeit in a pedrated way. Marx too connected colonialist foreign constructs back to Europe's own self-image. In contrast to Kant, however, Marx applied the fetish concept not only to religion, but also to social and political relations in Europe. From Hegel's point of view, this would be a pure anachronism. After all, the rational idea, which for him is supposed to have left fetish and idolatry far behind in history, resists the rebirth of archaic cults. Marx, however, would not need to provide the subjective history interpretation of the course of history in order for fetish to become relevant again in the modern context. In his confrontation with religious positions in Prussia, which sought to legitimize land ownership to the detriment of the people's material interests, Marx identified structural similarities between the fetishistic practices of worship among ancient peoples and Prussian relations of power. Thank you for attention. Okay, thank you for working on the interesting presentation, Kang Kang Kang. So if you have any questions and comments, could you give it? Is there any question and comments about Dr. Kang Kang's presentation? Okay, David refers to questions, I think. Hi, uh, thanks, Khan, for this uh, great presentation. And it, it, it covers um, a material that, that I, I've only encountered in really in one other, or in two other places, um, and also in the work that I'm, I'm, I'm working on at the moment. Uh, in Mikhail Lifshitz's philosophy of, of art of Karl Marx, of course, this was one of the first people, to my knowledge, actually, the first person who wrote about the Bond notebooks ever and sort of built a, a theory of, of Marx's lost aesthetic, departing from them, among other uh, textual artifacts. I now had a question, maybe connecting Lifshitz's work, which, which had a sort of hidden anti-modernist and anti-avant-garde agenda, um, and um, your your talk, you mentioned that um, the trumpet and uh, and, and uh, the, the Bowers to tre treatises, um, which were actually anonymous, planned as anonymous publications, if I'm if, if I'm not mistaken, were kind of philosophical fiction, uh, masterworks of philosophical fiction. Um, to me, and maybe to Lifshitz also, it, it always, I mean, in Lifshitz's explanation, it always sounds like they were almost a kind of avant-garde 
uh, fiction, if you will, a kind of avant-gardistic practice. Could this be, this is maybe a, the, the, my first question, uh, that uh, Marx's change of heart is also a rejection of those kind of textual practices and a choice in favor of some other textual practices that has yet to be defined. You talked about the articles on, on the wood, wood theft and on the censorship. Would those be, for an example, a source to look for that textual practice? That's, that's one, the one question. And the other question is, how do you read Marx's Bonn notebooks and his entire endeavor against the background of two recent critiques of Marx that are very important somehow, I think, to all of us who are interested in, 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 in this intellectual history. Um, you know, it comes as a, as a shock almost when, when you hear Marx being accused of racism, accused of a kind of, you know, mirroring and mimesis of colonial uh, attitudes and just taking them over kind of mindlessly and, and being, being a victim of them. Um, uh, I ask this also with the entire weight of the question um, of how these Bond notebooks, in your view, are related to the work that also comes up in parallel, which is, of course, and, you know, Marx's entire change of heart to, toward Bauer's sort of related to, of course, the text on the Jewish question, which is a critique of all. Um, so, you know, this is, there's an argument that's been made recently in a recent book um, about fetishism that reapproaches fetishism that says, yes, this is how Marx was negotiating by, you know, being basically more racist, even the racists and developing a theory of the fetish. This is actually how he was passing as a, you know, as a non-Jew and writing anti-Semitic text at the same time. This is a simplistic theory, of course, that I would, you know, reject as spurious, but I sort of wonder how, how you feel about that. So those are two questions, avant-garde and post-colonialism to, to put it in, in the shortest way. Thanks. Sorry to, to be so long-winded about it. Okay. Um, I, I, I would suggest that I answer the questions and now we, um, proceed with the next question afterwards. Uh, so I have noted three points. That is one point plus uh, two questions. The first thing concerns Lifshitz. Uh, indeed, if you are looking for a monography that deals with Bonn notebooks, uh, possibly or almost certainly Lifshitz is the first one. And indeed, af after him, there's only Margaret Rose. And this is really I am something like this third person who is <laughs> dealing with Bond notebooks in the uh, history of Marx scholarship, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, now, uh, but before Lifshitz, of, of course, there was Ryazanov who wrote some um, sketchy com commentaries on Bond notebooks. Mm -hmm. So about this uh, first question, the avant-garde and uh, anti-modernity of Lifshitz. So I am aware of your other translation uh, by Lifshitz on ugliness. This, this is an old topic in young Hegelian circles. There is this uh, discussion on the um, aesthetics of ugliness that is um, presented at length by uh, Theodor Vischer. And that is one of the close associates of, of Arnold Rubel, who also uh, published uh, quite a lot, a lot of things in Ruger's young Hegelian journals. Um, now, about this textual practice, or what I call philosophy fiction, um, you have mentioned this change of heart, and you have mm -hmm. to ask the question, why this happened? That is, why did he not, um, why did Marx not finalize his treaties and submit it and eventually publish it? So the predominant idea about the reason of, uh, the, of this decision uh, or the reason for this change of art is uh, divided. One suggests, and that is the semi-official opinion of Mega 2, that Marx suspected um, his, the correctness of his previous um, ideas and strategies or tactics uh, as to how to take on the contemporary uh, aesthetic cultural battles. And accordingly, uh, he realized that he was wrong about this sort, this sort of angle, 
that is an angle that is based on a philosophy of fiction, that you try to erect your own enemy in order to actually uh, actively domesticate it uh, to your own ends. So the official idea suggests the official view uh, or semi-official view of Mugetsu suggests that Marx thought this was wrong. Um, according to another conviction, and this is Gareth Jones and his Marx biography, he is saying that uh, Marx was simply scared off by the censorship policy. So I am arguing for a third option. I don't think that censorship was a matter of concern for Marx because he continued publishing a lot of other things in the same years. And until the end of the shutting down of the uh, newspaper, he kept publishing things. And obviously censorship was not his problem. Uh, now, um, against mega two opinion, I am also arguing for the uh, strong possibility that he did not come to say uh, his own word about this, uh, this, this issue as to how to take down this cultural aesthetic hegemony, a term that he is also using in Bond notebooks. If you are, if you look at the the uh, excerpts from uh, Grund on Greek and Egyptian arts. There, most of the notebooks are excerpts. That is, Marx is not making his own comments, comments, but he's using some keywords to summarize the entire section and so on. So there's this one passage where he's using his own word, that is hegemony. And this hegemony is used in pretty Gramscian sense of the term. And, and that does not say much about what he thought of the term or how he intended to use the term in this context. But this gives an idea about the scope and general intention as to uh, what, what Marx was aiming at. So I believe the target remained the same. The, the importance of and significance of his cultural aesthetic target remained uh, for a long time. In 1843, he is writing to Ruger uh, in a letter in which he speaks of the Prussian king, the new Prussian king since 1840, and he calls Prussian king something like a political aesthetic gourmanderie or something. That, it, that suggests that uh, Marx kept this vision and horizon. And you know that um, he was repeatedly concerned with aesthetic questions as he made his excerpts in the 1850s from Vichet, but also in Grundrasse, he, he's still asking these questions concerning aesthetics. One very interesting question about uh, aesthetics in Columbus uh, is this, uh, even if you do not believe in this particular religion, say the Hellenic, Hellenic uh, pagan religion, how come do you come to appreciate the aesthetic aspects of the sculptures and the waste paintings and so on? So I believe that um, the problem is not that, uh, that there was a significant change of art uh, that concerns the content or the attitude, but rather that he did not um, set this as the primary task um, of his uh, criticisms and political attacks. So his primary concern was religion rather than how art was employed by religion. So that, that, might, that might be the reason that, is, that he considered this religious art as a secondary question. That might be the reason why he did not come to finalize his treaties. Um, so that's that. Um, I don't want to say more about the second question, although there is some, uh, some, there are some things that I could have said on Lefschitz and his anti-modernism. So, for instance, his distaste of uh, of fetish and um, his positioning or counterposing of fetish and art, and his monolithic identification of the beautiful and art that is. Um, in my understanding, Lipschitz has this problem of an aesthetics of ugliness or, an, uh, or, or uh, ugliness as an aesthetic category because he seems to equate uh, pretty in a Hegelian, uh, pretty in, in a Hegelian fashion um, the beautiful and the artistic, which is really a kind of a uh, bad prejudice if you are uh, reading Bond notebooks and trying to picture what was uh, crossing Mark's mind. Um, this marks racism issue. Yes, this is an old issue. In fact, this happened very recently, I believe, in Spiegel, in the German journal last year. 
uh, people suddenly took up Marx's writings in Jewish question, where Marx is again uh, playing with words, um, trying to relativize Bauer's uh, positions and um, in questions concerning uh, Jewish question. And there is an anti, there was an anti-Semitism that was pretty strong in Prussia, um, because of which Marx's father was uh, was forced to change his confession, his religion. Um, from a Jewish to Protestant Christian uh, Christian religion, so he is actually um, witness and victim of this hatred toward Jews, and just like you, I don't share this uh, this charge against Marx that he was racist or an anti-Semite. Mm-hmm. Is a a very absurd charge to make, I believe. Um, and in addition to this, if you look at the Bonn notebooks and what he studied, his sources, especially Charles de Pros, is uh, it can be considered, um, if not racist, but uh, Eurocentric. That has uh, racist connotations, just like Hegel. Hegel has also the, does not have any uh, sensibility towards race issues. The ones we would call uh, race issues at the time. He seems to be rather blind to these issues. So if you look at uh, the sources of Marx, the, the, the kind of sources that predetermine Marx's directions in his um, earlier years and his intellectual journey. And if you look at what he has written in 1842 in the uh, newspaper articles, you would see that he's actually playing off this foreign image or the image of foreign cultures against those who employ uh, this, this Eurocentric images of foreign cultures. So for instance, there's this, uh, this, uh, this text I've just quoted where Marx is atta- attacking Hermes. Her- Hermes is the kind of, um, the kind of you know, conservative you know, philosopher, theolog- uh, the theological philosopher, who you know, likes to make a distinction of these primitive cultures that he compares with the is, uh, assumed you know, high culture um, of the, the Christian religion. So he's taking, uh, Marx is taking this implied or imposed image of foreign cultures and plays this off against those who invented those images. In that regard, the sort of char- charge of, um, of, of well, Marx's so called racism just does not fit if you. Um, or it does not hold if you um, consider the claims uh, with the textual evidence that we have. I hope this answers this, your two questions. And we have one more question from Douglas Mogachi. Yes, thank you, Khan. It was very good to hear your, your talk. <clears throat> I, I particularly liked your, evo- <clears throat> sorry, your evocation of the Posana argument. It was a very vivid reconstruction. Um, I'm just wondering whether you think there's any uh, important political differences between Marx and Bauer at this time, um, and, and whether that those differences might account for uh, a shift of position in Marx's work. Well, um, that's a pretty difficult question because what we have in 1842, especially in the first half of 1842, um, is uh, first of all, other than his journal article, other than his newspaper articles, we have only the philosophical work. That's dissertation plus this joint work with with Bauer. In that regard, I'm not sure whether this question is um, is 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 um, asked um, or whether this is a a correct question. Now, if you would ask whether there are differences in 1843 between Marx and Bauer, I would clearly say yes. Or 1844, yes. 1845, yes. 46, yes. 47, yes. But 1842, especially the first half where they are working together. And Marx rather figures as the pupil of um, Bauer. I cannot say that there is any visible political difference between Bauer and Marx, but I would say philosophically there is a difference. 
And that is a difference that I have articulated in this, uh, in this piece I published last year. And that concerns this objectivity of religion and subjectivity of religion. I believe you have disagreed with that argument. Marx in the dissertation is emphasizing the objective effectivity or the objective effects uh, of, of, of religion where he criticizes Kant and Kant's argument concerning the ontological existence of God. Marx is saying that whether God really exists or not doesn't matter. What matters is the social aspect of religion. And since then on, uh, religion remained a social question, whereby for Bauer, I would argue, that remained a theological philosophical question. So in that regard, I would see a difference. And um, other than that, I, I'm not able to distinguish a political tendency in Marx that is different from what you would call a republicanism of Bauer. So um, indeed, this is a difficult question, but the material, uh, the textual material does not allow to uh, give a full answer to the question. In that regard, you know, I try to say that I had difficulty in answering <laughs> this question. We can have the more time. Could you, do you have any more questions about the, Dr. Khan Kanga's presentation? It's really path-breaking and very pro provoking thought. Um, yeah, let's, let's give like one or two minutes to okay. the audience. Hmm. I believe my material is a little heavy. Also, it is pretty unknown. The, the, the topic itself is not discussed. So understandably, mm. our people have to take some time to um, find something to... Okay, yeah. I think there are no more questions. So it's yeah. Oh, yeah. David, you have to. Yeah, uh, yeah. I since no, just maybe maybe to continue a, a bit. Um, I do have one additional comment um, about about Lifshitz's actual conservatism or whatever. Um, I mean, I belong to maybe a, a whole group of people who interprets things a little bit differently. So that, you know, what you said about, about Lifshitz really in, identifying art with the beautiful or so doesn't really hold. In fact, um, I would say that in some ways, the crisis of ugliness, this book that you referred to from 1968, which is a polemic against Picasso and Warhol and so on, is at the same time a polemic against Plikhanov in secret who used this uh, crisis bizabrazia, crisis of ugliness term. Um, it's actually a, a quite subversive book and in that way shares some characteristics of the posaune, you know? So it's, it's actually building up an enemy and, you know, in order to come with a, a different agenda, but at the same time sort of defeating, you know, it, 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 all, it, it may be in the way that Marx also, also steps out of Hege Hegelianism and strict young Hegelianism. Lifshitz is not, certainly not a modernist, but he's also not a classical anti-Soviet, uh, a classical Soviet uh, anti-modernist. So, um, that's just a small comment that I think that actually this this book was you know this this whole work and the bond notebooks in particular were, were quite inspirational and may even be considered as a kind of paradigm for Lipschitz when he was working on these anti-modernist texts in a, in a subversive way um, I find it interesting that Marx himself becomes less subversive and that he sort of rejects, rejects, um, let's say this, this, you know, make believe world of, of being a pietist pastor and goes for a more direct satirical mode. Also then employing the Bond notebooks clearly as material. So some of the, you know, some that he's really just sitting there and actually ex using excerpts that he wrote down, you know, 
some months prior uh, and drawing upon them as, as any writer would when they're working. So that those are those are just those are comments about the kind of technicalities. But I think I think with Lifshitz it's it's more complex, um, and I think there is a kind of you know an an anti modernist modernism to be spoken of both with him and with Lukacs, you know with that whole group. Um, it's things are not so simple as they would be with other anti modernists from the socialist from the re actually existing socialist countries. So that was mm -hmm. just a small comment I wanted to offer as a rejoinder. Or, you know, there is, there is this German term, Selbstverblendung. Um, this means, th this is something that, that, you know, that has to do with a um, ideological obstruction. That is, uh, you're looking at something and you're blinded by uh, what you believe in that disables you to see things that are there. Um, this was my impression of what was taking place in... Lefschetz's interpretation of Marx um, in his period of Bond Notebooks, because of this issue of ugliness, I thought that um, Lefschetz is not really capable of following what, what was happening when Bauer and Marx decided to employ this, what I call an aesthetic ideology of terror that is terrorizing the kind of audience that they ventured to um, cultivate and domesticate. And this is a really a, a, a matter of playing with the culture and aesthetic and political imagination of the German public. And that was really practiced by Bauer actively and Marx was supposed to make a contribution to this, uh, this, this, this play of the imagination of the political. And um, if uh, from the outset you deny or exclude the significance of the ugly that is so central for this play of imagination of the political in Bauer and Marx, then you are not really able to, um, then you are not really going to make a much, much progress in grasping what was crossing Marx's mind when he was making these excerpts, because that was this, this ugliness was the very practice in these two volumes to which Marx intended to contribute. So that was indeed uh, my obstacle that I had uh, when I was uh, reading reading Lefschetz, but you are certainly right that uh, there, there there is more going on in Lefschetz's own account, and his book is not limited to Marx's one notebooks. There is also a couple of uh, there are also a couple of things that he has written on Marx and Leninism, uh, materialist dialectics that are equally problematic. But um, in the case of Lefschetz, I would take these as fruitful paradox or fruitful contradictions that may uh, be utilized to uh, formulate new questions rather than condemn these old answers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we have to stop here. And once again, thank you everyone for joining Global Marxism Talk and thank you all for Khan Kanga to deliver much insightful presentation and share the provoking ideas. The Global Marxism Talks will continue every single week for examining the current conjuncture through the spectrum of Marxist thoughts. Please pay attention to coming up all the talks. Then we will close today's talk. I look forward to seeing you in the next talk. Thank you for everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kangar. Okay, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.